So welcome everybody. We're back here in our Monday night study and we're in the book of Psalms. This is Psalms starting in chapter 9 verse 11. And the Psalms are a very important it's a very important book and it's it's very good especially when you're really going through suffering because it really describes the process that we go through and what it feels like to go through this this judgment and the overcoming. And the, as you read through it, we'll see there's a lot of ups and there's a lot of downs. And it's very comforting and descriptive to know that what we're going through is not strange and that it was planned ahead of time and that everyone goes through the same steps and the same process here. So Psalms 911, sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the people. So it, it's a very important thing when the scriptures talk about praise and worship and, and singing. And the Apostle Paul talks about it in Philippians and Thessalonians. Um, this is Philippians 4.4. 4. He says, Rejoice in in the Lord always, and I say again, rejoice. So he has to write that because it's not a natural thing to do when you're being crushed and losing your life and you don't like what's going on to rejoice. And it takes walking by faith and not by sight to understand that these things are good and they are necessary and that the Lord is working all things for good, even when we really don't like it. And it's very unpleasant. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he says, Rejoice all, this is verse 16, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Well, we do not naturally rejoice always. We naturally complain always, and we don't pray without ceasing. And the only way that we get to this place is the Lord presses us so hard that you just have no other choice but to pray without ceasing. And then you realize that he's stronger than you, and he's going to do what he's going to do anyway, and it's hard to kick against the pricks. So you eventually learn to rejoice even when you don't, your flesh doesn't like what's going on, because there's nothing else to do. You can't fight God. And the more that we fight it, the, the worse it is. So that's why the scriptures talk about a sacrifice of praise, because it is a sacrifice. You're not always, you know, happy when it's going on, but you know that it's good. And that singing praises is part of the walking by faith and not by sight and putting trust in him and his process, which we naturally just don't like and don't want to do. So, you know, don't, don't be surprised when it's a real battle to be able to do that because there's a lot of bitterness in, in this walk. There's a lot of, um, you know, being angry at the Lord and not liking the process. And so, it's, all, it's a season everyone goes through, but we have to come out of it and sing his praises and declare his deeds that our flesh may not like what he does, but it's very effective and it does produce good fruit and it does cause us to do what he wants to do. And we see how it profits others. And that's how we become that living sacrifice. And we come to see that it's the only way that it works. When he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. The scriptures tell us if we humble ourselves, this is um, Matthew 23, 12. It says, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Well, that's exactly where we start off is exalting ourselves, boasting in our works, boasting on tomorrow, thinking about how you know great we are and all the wonderful works we're doing for the Lord. And, and then he just absolutely grinds us to powder and shows you there's nothing good in you. And everything you think you were, do, were doing was good wasn't. 
and only then in that place of humility and brokenness and you know when you feel empty that the lord does show you that christ is in you and you're humble now and you're you're doing the service through the weakness like paul says when he's weak then he's strong and he boasts in his affirmity in his infirmities because they they are what gives him his power have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble from those who hate me, you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of your praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. So we certainly have people in this life who hate us and give us a lot of persecution and a hard time, but the biggest enemy we have is that old man within himself. He's the one that's bitter against God and doesn't like this process and murmurs and complains and and that's the greatest enemy. But we do have to cry out for mercy because it is a heavy plague. As we read out, read in Deuteronomy, um, I believe it's Deuteronomy. I was just reading this. Chapter 28. So this is, this is uh, your homework for tonight is read all of Deuteronomy chapter 28. And at the beginning, it lists off all of the blessings for keeping the commands. And the second half, it lists off all the curses. And that list of curses, it's pretty terrifying, especially when you start going through it and you start experiencing it and you look back on why is everything I put my hand on turned to dung and been crushed? And, you know, this chapter explains it very well. And when you go through that, you're definitely come out of it begging for mercy because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And um, when it happens, it's... It works. It produces the fruit that we want, but it is, as Christ says, fear the one who destroys both body and soul in hell. That's what he does. He, he crushes you so much that there's nothing left, and you're just despairing of life and hanging on, and you're, you're crying out for that mercy. And what we want is those who trouble us, the, the old man and the carnal mind who can't make it through this. That's what we need to be lifted up from. And so we have to remember that he does promise that he won't tempt us beyond what we're able. It sure feels like it, but he says it's not, and he makes a way a way out. That we may tell of his praises in, in the gates. I will rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they have made, in the net which they hid. Their own foot is caught. This goes back to... Deuteronomy 28, we are those nations, and our own backslidings reprove us, and we fall into our own pits. And as you, as you read through Deuteronomy 28, it makes it really clear that we don't keep the Lord's commands, and he sends an incurable and prolonged, I think it says a prolonged disease to us that does not go away easily. And that's part of the thorn in the flesh that it talks about. The Lord gives us grace to make it through it, but it is a thorough and complete crushing so that you know there's just nothing left. All you have is to cling to the, the mercy of the Lord and to do it his way. And it just takes so much more than we'd ever imagine to get us ground down su sufficiently. that I may tell of your praise in the gates in the daughter of Zion. Rejoice in your salvation. These nations have sunk down in the pit which they made, in the net which they hid. Their own foot is caught. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. Well, we don't trust him with all of our heart, and we don't acknowledge him. We do it our way. And in our anxiety and fear and desire to get what we want, we look for every shortcut and we worship every idol along the way, fornicate with everything that can be fornicated with, and we end up with all those curses. And it's, and it's, it's a terrible, fearful thing to fall into it, but it's the only way that we can come out truly humble, knowing there's nothing good within us, seeing that the Lord's way is the only way. And it makes us very diligent and careful with every step that we take. Because at first we just don't have that fear. But once you go through this process, your fear is definitely 
heightened, very much heightened. Um, the Lord is known by the judgment he executes. That, that is Deuteronomy 28, all those things. The wicked is snared in the work of his hands. Meditation, Salah. So when we're tempted to murmur and complain about what the Lord is doing, we have to look back on how we've conducted ourselves for a very long period of time. And we'll come to see that there's just the good wasn't there. The things the Lord commands are not there. And he did it. He's subject us to vanity. We can't argue with that. And this is his process. And he definitely brings about the judgments. And, it, and at first, it is just like Romans 9. You're like, Lord, why do you judge me and do these things when you're the one that made me this way? And Romans 9 says, does the potter speak back to the clay and say, why did you make me this way? And we have to remember what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.17, lest we become overrun with bitterness of the process, is... He says, this is verse 4, chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We have to look on that inward being renewed and have our mind on things above and the end result. Otherwise, we will fall into bitterness and we will lose heart because the outward man is perishing. And it's... It's uh, It takes a miracle of the heart and the mind to overcome that and not be trapped in that, in that pit of despair. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Well, that, that is, we definitely forget the Lord. Um, like it says in Proverbs 30, Verses 8 to 9. Remove, this is two things I request. Do not deprive before I die. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food allotted to me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? So when we're prospered, we forget the Lord and say, who are you? Everything's fine. We just go off on our merry way. Or... We be poor and steal and profane his name. It's another way of you know, forgetting God. We, we fall into such despair and poverty of spirit that you know, we just start grasping for every idol we can reach to try to get out of it. So that's why the prayer is, give me neither riches nor poverty. That's learning to be content in all things. And it's something that is only learned over time. Through, through this process. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. You know, like Christ says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So when we go through this process and the judgment, it definitely makes us feel poor and needy and it grinds out that proud spirit. And that's when the Lord is merciful and gives us the, the things we need to, to make it through. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Those nations are the things that we think in our own heavens. And we definitely think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And that fear of the Lord is a treasure. And when he brings it about, we definitely know we are but men. And we are much more careful with our words and, and knowing that the Lord can do whatever he wants. And the more you have that fear, then the more godliness it, it, it brings about. So his process works. It is effective. 
And we should sing praises to the Lord for the things he's doing and the deeds he declares among all the people. And we need to encourage each other to, to do that because there's definitely times where it is very challenging. But he will give us that spirit to overcome it and to, to make it through. All right, we'll go on to chapter 10 then. Why do you hide yourself? Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? This is exactly how we feel when this process gets really heavy. You're, you're in pain or distress, whether it be physical or mental or emotional or however it is that we're being afflicted. And we say, Lord, why are you hiding yourself? Why are you hiding yourself? And we can't feel him. We can't see him. You know, the only thing we have is the faith that he said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. And that this process is necessary to get us where we need to be. The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. So you, you certainly have, you know, outwardly in our lives, there are wicked who persecute the poor in spirit. That, that give us a hard time and just like Christ got persecuted for, for walking in the truth and doing it right. But so too is it these, and the most painful ones, is it's your, the thoughts in your own heavens that creates all that persecution. But the Lord will catch him in those plots and he will um, overthrow those wicked and establish his, his kingdom in due time. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. So that is the spirit we have. We, we boast of our heart's desire. We want what we want. We want it to turn out the way we want to. And we do not like the Lord's way and the Lord's plan, which is looking at Christ's life. It was a life, it was a life of sacrifice. And, and, I, and I was thinking about it today, and I was thinking, Lord, how come it, you know, Seemingly, Christ's process was quick. His ministry was three and a half years, and you know he hung on the cross a couple of days. I mean, a short period of time, and he was done. And and our process seems to just drag out over months and years. But we have to remember that all the things that Christ did were done in parables. Um, that's a verse in Mark. All done in parables. So not not only did he speak in parables. But um, I'm quoting King James here. It says, And he said unto them, Unless unto you it is given to know this, the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all things are done in parables. All things, his whole ministry, even his crucifixion was done in a parable. And we're also told that with the Lord, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. So our process is certainly not, you know, three and a half year ministry like Christ. Our crucifixion is not done in just a number of hours. Like Paul says, he dies daily. He's crucified with Christ. So our lives are very much drawn out. This, this death takes time. And we have to see the spirit behind those letters of the walk of Christ, lest we be, you know, comparing it physical with physical and being discouraged at how long it takes for us to, you know, get, get through this thing. It's the same thing as looking at Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. We don't have to literally wander 40 years, but it takes how long it takes. And certain things do take 40 years and certain take longer and certain take less. So it's, it's important to understand that just as, God hid his face from Christ in a little wrath. This is um, Isaiah 54, 8. In a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, says the Lord thy Redeemer. This is when we're saying, Lord, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? His face is hidden. We don't see it. But he also says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 31.6. He says, 
says, Be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that does go with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. So Christ knew this. And we feel forsaken, but we have to know that we're not forsaken, even when the flesh is you know, being, the flesh is what's being forsaken. The new man is what's being raised. But when the outward is perishing, it takes a lot of faith to be able to hold on to that through the, through the process. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. So part of this process is we definitely have this inward rebellion. And we have times you just don't even want to hear the word or even even pray. Like you're just you're so bitter and upset about the process that we don't seek God in that wicked and proud season. And God is not in his thoughts. We're just lamenting and mourning and grieving the loss of our life, of the things that we that we want. But it's a season, and the Lord delivers us from that season. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. That that's the proud spirit and, and the thoughts that come to us. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. The, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things, and it is not, the hard, stony heart does not receive adversity and tribulation well. You can look at the book of Job. Job took it well for a while, but eventually it got, became too much, and then he started the, you know, the bitterness and the complaining and the you know, questioning God and asking for his day in court before the Lord. And God had him talk for 40 chapters, and then he finally spoke to him and you know, put Job in his place. And we're all the same way. You know, we don't think our mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression, but you know, get pressed hard enough, long enough, and you'll see it come out. And it's there, and it's ugly. He sits in lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws them into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. This, this is the strength of the beast. This is the dragon that gives power to the beast. And this is that great war in heavens. And, and those evil spirits have no interest in anything of God. They don't want the trials. They don't want to lay their life down. They want to protect their life at, at all costs. And we see this manifest in, in the physical world with the persecution of the poor. But it's really about what happens in the heavens as that great battle starts to, to pick up pace and become very intense as the old man starts losing his kingdom, he puts up this, this fight, and it is a huge, intense war. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. You know, th that's the, the hopeless, discouraged state and the proud spirit of the old man that that comes up. It doesn't remember and believe those promises that the Lord says he'll never leave us and forsake us. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. I mean, go through your walk. We're going to say and think every single one of these things. And, and we do... There's that mustard seed of faith in the middle of all these evil spirits swirling around in your head. You do have this mustard seed of faith that says, Lord, don't forget the humble. Arise up here and put down these, these wicked spirits in my heavens and give me dominion over this so that I can 
keep your commands and do what we're supposed to do so we can get to the blessing part of Deuteronomy 28. But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. So we're first of our father, the devil. And once we lose that father, that's when we become humble and he sees our trouble and grief. And that's when we begin to be helped. But as long as we're in this you know, rebellious, argumentative, proud stage of, of the father, the devil, the the fire just keeps coming down. The hail keeps coming. You know, the only way for Pharaoh to release Israel is it's plague after plague after plague. And, you know, it's easy to see that old Pharaoh needed those plagues or other stubborn people around us need those plagues, but we don't tend to think of ourselves as needing those plagues. But the, the longer you go down this walk, the more you realize how much it takes to, to drive out those, those evil spirits and get that, that humble, submissive spirit that can suffer through trials joyfully and can take the destruction of the flesh and whatever the Lord brings and can rejoice through it. And it's an absolute miracle to, to have that. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. So once we suffer under these evil oppressive spirits for long enough and we see how horrible it is in there, we start crying for this. Like, Lord, break the arm of this wicked man. Get rid of him. Give me the power to rejoice in all things and, and pray without ceasing and, and to take this well, to not worry about tomorrow and to be diligent in the things we've been put before us. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. The, these nations are all the negative things we just read about. He is, they're going to perish out of his land because it's going to be his kingdom and his reign. Lord, you've heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. This is the old man, the beast on the throne, all those things in our heavens that trouble us so, and do not submit to God. And as that man is taken off, we become the fatherless and the humble. And the heart is prepared to be softened and to receive that and to accept what our function is in this life, like Christ, to lose our life, to be like Paul. Um, or he says, I rejoice in my afflictions. Colossians 124. To re now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, for I fill up in my body what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ for, the for his body's sake, for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I have become a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Well, we're so busy trying to save our own lives and complain about all the things that we don't like that are going on that we can't fill up what is lacking for anybody. We can't be of any service. We, we have to get that complaining spirit out and we have to move to the rejoicing always and seeing what our function is through all these sufferings and then we begin, can begin to fulfill this ministry and re rejoice in these things and like Paul says to beat his body and make it his slave his body um, this is Beat his body makes slave. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 9.27. Um, Therefore, I, thus I run, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest after I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Our members have to be presented as to righteousness, and we have to get dominion over this beast so that we can go and be a living sacrifice to to others and to do that service. But it takes a lot of preparation and a lot of trials to get us humble and obedient and submissive and and have the fruit of the spirit of self-control. It is definitely a, a big work to get there, but it's necessary, and it needs to happen if we're going to fulfill the calling that the Lord has is drug dragging us all 
too. So that's our aspiration, um, to learn to be content in all things, to learn to rejoice in all things, and to learn to be able to serve others uh, with a joyful heart so we can see Christ prosper in those around us. So that's the end of chapter 10. We'll stop here for tonight. If anybody wants to add anything or ask anything, go right ahead. Right. Well, I'm just going to mute everybody so y'all can greet each other. Hi, Daryl. Saw you come in here. Hey, how are you doing? Doing all right. Yeah, that's a nice day. It's really good that you must be. Um, the Lord really have to fall on you so that he can really crush you so that you can be a uh, service for him to yourself and for others. And uh, we really have to realize that we, we really do have to be, be at our wit's end in order for us. And then in the military, I know what it is for a ship to go down and come back up. And sometimes that's the way we feel, we feel like, Oh God, it's hurting. I know I've been seasick before. And you you know, most people have been seasick. You don't want to be seasick. But when it comes to spiritual things, that's what you need. You need to be seasick, so to speak, so that you can come back up so that eventually you'll be able to help others. Yeah. Amen, Daryl. There's a there's a verse that talks about um with much knowledge is much sorrow. And so the more we learn, the more the Lord pours on us here. And then we definitely get the Ecclesiastes 7.3. Um, sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. It's very sobered to the reality of what life is and how temporal it is and how vain it is. And what is the only thing that matters it, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth or rejoicing. And it takes a lot of suffering to be in that house of mourning, but it's very effective and very fruitful. So amen, Daryl. Uh, Hi, Cameron. Saw you come in there. Hello, Mitch. Hello. Good, good study. I appreciate it, Cameron. It's uh, very, very timely for me. This stuff is all, all too real right now. So it's helpful to get it out. You uh, mentioned anybody else in the world this morning, but is there a time in your life where you just feel like you don't know what you're doing? I mean, you know you're a Christian, you know you, you want to, but sometimes it seems like you're on an island by yourself. Oh, yeah, I know that season. Yeah. Just got to keep walking. Yeah. Yep, it's quite a process. But I've gotten a lot of benefit from I've got this audio Bible I turn on and I listen to Psalms and 
oh my goodness, it's just so descriptive of the whole process, and it's very, it gets you through those long, those long nights. I know that it was all written. And what helped me is that I do know that all these things that we go through, it was playing out for God, and me knowing that God will never get mistakes. Um, I might not get understand, but um, I know that all things are working out for the time. For those who come before. We can't hear you, Daryl. You sound real broken up and far away. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. You know, what I was saying that uh, during these times of trouble, uh, there's certain scriptures that I repent, uh, depend on. But one thing that keeps me going, that helps me, is that I know that God is orchestrating all these things, even though it don't feel good at the time. But I always settle back on that. Well, this is the will of God concerning me. And that helps me get through this time of trouble. Yep. That's right. That's a good point. Um, to you a verse, I've learned a lot about Proverbs 18, 14. It says, The spirit of man will sustain him in sickness, but a broken spirit. But who can bear a broken spirit? And our spirit gets broken when we lose hope and when those wicked spirits run loose in our heavens and, and tell us all those discouraging, lying things we read and we just read in Psalms 10. So we can, we can endure tremendous amounts of things in this life if our heavens are right. And so that's what the purpose of all these Psalms are is to Turn the thoughts and intents of the heart and get it cleaned up up there so we can endure whatever it is the Lord is putting before us. Because it's, uh, it is, the storms come, there's no doubt about it. It's just about being prepared to weather them successfully. To make it through with a good attitude and a good rejoiceful spirit. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. It was nice to see you. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks, Mitch. Thank you. Thanks, Priya. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mitch. Thank you, Mitch. All right. See you all next time. All right. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. See you, Cam. Bye.